at the annual SHOT Show. That's short for Shooting, Hunting, and Outdoor Trade Show. This is the largest collection of capitalists in the shooting sports industry. Uh, this, this really is a combination trade show, uh, hootenanny, uh, uh, alumni reunion. It's a $30 billion industry that's more than just guns and ammo. It's outfits and accessories and gadgets. Because guns to these people are not only a way of life, they're a state of mind. When they look in the front of that barrel, that's, that's, there isn't any doubt about what's going on there. And nobody's confused in the room about who's who and what's what at that point in time. And you solve a lot of social arguments instantly by just looking at one of these. I mean, you want to be the city in America that has no guns in, in any of the houses in the city? Marva Gaskins probably would. She understands another part of the gun culture, because she lives it here in North Philadelphia. In a neighborhood they call the Badlands. It came up on the porch? Yeah, it came up here. And see? What? And they really? shot into the house? Yeah, see? Holy. In Philadelphia, the rate of gun murders has been going up steadily, while the national average has gone down. That is a gunshot? Yes. Valerie Wall's daughter was shot to death on her front steps. It's kind of hard, you know, having your child. For 22 years, talking to her early that day, and not being able to see her no more, you know. Mm -hmm. It's hard for me to come outside, sit on my stuff, because if I look down, you know, I'm looking at my child laying down there. I will tell you gonna be on TV. More than 300 people were killed by handguns in Philadelphia last year. You taping now? Most between the ages of 15 and 25. I mean, you're not like soft enough, and if you got a gun and another person got a gun and they just want to like show it off, that's really all it is about around here is like showing off. Recently up here at Broaden Erie, a cop was sitting in his car writing out a report. Young guy went on a rampage shooting up the neighborhood up there, and you know, he shot the cop's tires out. So otherwise, see, they don't, have, they don't even fear the cops. But it's not just the hundreds that are killed every year. There were five in just one weekend last March. But it's the uncounted victims, the ones who are injured and maimed for life or left widowed and orphaned. I'd like to introduce you to Khadija. It was in the emergency room at Children's Hospital that I met a child named Khadija. She's 16 years old. She'd been well, shot in the stomach by her boyfriend. Shot. I got shot January the 27th. I lost all my short intestines. I start school next week for like a half a day. Mm -hmm. I don't really want to go because I don't know how you know people gonna think and how people gonna look at me and stuff. Mm, I can't hold much in my stomach. I can't drink a lot of fluid like regular people drink or eat. I can't. I think I came a long way and I feel much better. But I wish I could be picked like I was. But this town's got a mayor who just won't give up. If I was in a boat and it was sinking and all I had was a little bucket, I'd be, and it was an ocean liner, I'd be bailing out with that little bucket until the water came over my eyebrows. Ed Rendell decided he'd had enough and he was going to do something about it. Now, this is a guy who everybody agrees brought the city back from the brink of financial collapse. If he could fix the city's money problems, he was ready to take on something even bigger. The mayor is putting together the elements for a federal lawsuit against gun makers. It was last July when the local Fox station broke the story. Now sources say the mayor is planning something dramatic to deal with gun violence, and he's setting his sights on a big target, the gun manufacturers. Several major lawsuits against the gun industry have already failed, but Rendell's would follow the pattern of the tobacco case claiming the industry has created a public nuisance by producing millions of weapons which they know are going into the hands of criminals. David Carey's drafted the complaint. It's a question of whether they are responsible in damages for the direct harm, the harm they know they do to the cities. And that, that can start with the 911 call or cleaning blood from the streets, and it could extend to, to the extent of uh, hospital costs, uh, or taking care of an orphan child. So Ed Rendell planned to sue the gun manufacturers in the city where the Second Amendment, which guarantees citizens the right to bear arms, the city in which that guarantee was written. But by January, six months after the story broke, they were still deliberating. 
right now, only for, no one has tapped me on the shoulder and said, we'll join you and we'll absorb part of the costs. And I would have to spend, to litigate this case, millions of dollars of the taxpayers' money here in Philadelphia. And I want to make sure that at least we have a chance. So this is really a story about two Americas. One is urban, where guns are about survival. One is suburban, where guns are about sport. One is white, the other is black. What I'd like to show you is the journey I've taken through both. And it all begins on the streets where kids wear t-shirts in memory of the dead. Who was Kevin? My dad. This is ABC News Nightline. Brought to you by Honda Accord. All I was doing was shooting every night. One of the biggest drug corner was. You get anything you want back here, this is a shoot, shooter's alley. Jim Robertson and Patrick Peters are crisis counselors with an organization called the Philadelphia Anti-Drug, Anti-Violence Network. More to the point, they grew up on these streets and gave me a tour of their city. 357 is the best handgun you can have out here, man. It's a big boy, it's a revolver, and you ain't got to go through that hard shit. And the bullets are so easy to come by. And most of the bullets you come by, you can get for a 357. It's hollow tip, or they got, they got um, ball bearings in them. You do something that they think is bad enough, you get shot for it. What does it take? What's bad enough to get shot around your If way? somebody stupid, like, really has no control, it could take to get shot. It could take. To the doctors at Children's Hospital, gun violence was reaching epidemic proportions. Clothes get you shot. Mm -hmm. Jealousy, envy, they get you shot. These are not hardened kids. These are kids who I think are frightened out of their wits. If we look 20 years ago and we compare kids from 20 years ago to kids today, what is clear is that there have always been a group of kids who are scary. Kids who break the law and kids who break the rules and kids who do all sorts of things. I think that's part of adolescence. If we look around the world, there is nice data from European nations which suggests that rates of delinquency are not very different in European nations from rates of delinquency in this country. What is different in this country is kids can get their hands on a firearm. You already know. Everybody knows. No way. Like we can get a gun anytime we want. Family, I know. We all know. These are two kids I happen to meet on a street corner. Uh, no, family, tell me how easy this gun. You know how guns, I'm going to tell you how guns you got the in, in the motherfuckers. They look like mine. Uh, guns you got, because motherfuckers, they got licenses, buy them. Mm -hmm. Then they sell them at a level price to motherfuckers on the street. That. And that's how they the get the guns. The guns come from the What they call them, them big motherfuckers. No. I know there. a boy, I know nah, a boy that do this. He got a fucking license, he buy man. guns, and then he sell them to hustlers for a bigger price. And that's how it works. Somebody with a clean record gets a permit, buys the guns from a legitimate dealer, then sells them on the street for a substantial markup. It's called a straw purchase. It's a clean gun. It's never been used. They're not like they're getting a gun that's been used in, in crimes. 90% of the time, they're getting guns that are still in the boxes, brand new. An hour These cops didn't want their faces shown. They sometimes work undercover. A lot of the straw purchase, the straws, they'll go and buy guns to try to make a couple bucks. You know, they live in the inner city, they figure they can get a fast buck. Guns is what's happening. Guns and drugs go together. Guns and drugs and, and it's crime. Crime is a business. You think people want to stop crime? Nah. A lot of folks don't want to stop crime. The city tried to pass tougher gun laws four years ago. They were knocked down by the state legislature. In Pennsylvania, there are more NRA members than anywhere else in the country, except California. Before, the police department could say, why do you want to carry a gun? And if you couldn't come up with a compelling enough reason, then you could not be issued the permit. Well, that was, you can't. Well, that was, that was wiped out. So as a result was, now, pretty much anybody can get a permit to carry. You don't really have to make a great case. You just have to be a criminal. <laughs> If you're, I mean, essentially the litmus test is, are you a criminal? You can have numerous arrests for narcotics, robbery, for any felony, but it's not a conviction, and that person can buy a gun. 
half of all the retail gun sales in Philadelphia are multiple purchases. In other words, in half of the sales, someone will buy at least two guns. And almost 20% of the time, they buy between five and nine guns. The, the, what sort of generated this focus on handguns that is now sort of a freestanding uh, initiative, mm -hmm. we were looking at how to make neighborhoods safer for kids. When I first started following this story, everybody said the guy you got to talk to is Mike DeBerardinas. He's the recreation commissioner. In other words, he's in charge of all the parks and sports facilities for the city. I mean, that sounded funny, but actually, this is the guy who got the ball rolling on the issue in City Hall. If you look at the guns that are found in crime scenes in the city, you will find concealable, semi-automatic handguns as the majority, I think the overwhelming majority, 8 in 10 or 9 in 10 of crime guns found tra that are f found at crime scenes and, and traced by the ATF, uh, that's what they are. Once these little handguns were called Saturday Night Specials, and because they keep turning up in crimes, Philadelphia would like to ask a jury, are the manufacturers deliberately producing a weapon for the criminal market? Here we have Phoenix Arms. This is one of the uh, Ring of Fire manufacturers. Fine auto pistols for under a hundred dollars. Got these tiny guns, extremely appealing for crime use. Uh, the other use for them is for people carrying them in their pockets. They refer to it as a pocket pistol. Um, and uh, they know this means that people who have no training, uh, have never been tested or even, even asked about their, their ability to use self-control, are going to be carrying these in their in their uh, pockets, in their glove compartments of their cars. Here we have 9.9 ounces of prevention. It's this tiny Smith and Wesson that'll go. It would go in my shirt pocket, and weighs only 9.9 .9, uh, ounces. Um, inexpensive, extremely high power, rapid firing. Well, maybe not high power, rapid fire exactly, but it is small and cheap. Small, cheap concealable, semi-automatic. Now, people can make their judgments from who's buying them and who's using them. A year, there's easily 200 of them in the United States. They're all as different as the faces in their group picture. There's one thing they agree on, it's like the bumper sticker says, it's not guns that kill people, but the people who use them. And I was surprised to find out who agrees with them. They talk about, go do something about guns. This is not guns, it's condition the neighborhoods and what people allowed to happen, people in the neighborhoods. So, you know, we say it's just not guns. See the stuff here? Yeah. All this for factories. Jobs. Closed down. Once this area flourished, there were jobs and industry. The area's biggest employer now is the drug dealer. And, and the, my man, you wouldn't know how many deaths? I can tell you the heavy on this block right now. I can count over seven, seven shootings, of, seven shootings, deaths related with guns. Nobody was nobody wasn't never over 17. That's how young they was. And you see all down here? Mm -hmm. Drug and addicts. And you wanna talk about the city near about somebody they wanna do something about this? You see him stick the needles in his pocket? <laughs> mm -hmm. He's selling needles. Drug haven. Look, he's doing it, he don't even care. This neighborhood accounts for almost two-thirds of the city's drug trade and more than 25% of the homicides. What the f wrong with you, man? They're buying yeah. selling drugs, taking one of the right. drugs, and robbing people. You want to talk about people want to do something about crime? Yeah, right. And the roots of this area's decline go back more than 60 years. This is a map that was drawn up in 1935 by the HOLC. That's a precursor to the Federal Housing Administration. It was used by bankers in writing mortgages. The red areas are considered those that are hazardous, risky investments because they were and are mostly black neighborhoods. It's called redlining, and the map is a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's also where most of the shootings occur. I met Craig McCoy, a reporter with the Philadelphia Inquirer, as he was trying to piece together the life of the city's latest victim. But his profile is very typical of the Philadelphia murder victims. He's a young black man. It's a firearm death. Uh, I believe he has one adult conviction for drugs. Um, he has a pretty extensive juvenile and adult criminal record. And maybe that's the problem. The death of four white kids in Jonesboro or Springfield get immediate national attention. But 
400 kids in North Philadelphia, and, well, if you didn't live here, you probably wouldn't know about it. And why people got so much guns? You got the damn guns to survive around here. Because if you didn't have, you'd be finished. I understood his frustration a couple minutes later when a squad car appeared. This could be interesting. And started following him. Yeah, you know what they could do? Ride right foot by, ain't gonna stop. Sure enough, it was like they deliberately avoided all the streets where the drug dealing was going on, right in the open. Like nothing ain't going on. Well, this was back in September, and since then, there's signs that Rendell's campaign is starting to pay off. For one thing, the city got a new police commissioner in March, and the gun task force, working with ATF, has been identifying and tracking down straw purchasers. And the gun murder rate for the first four months of this year is down slightly. And as for Rendell taking on the gun manufacturers, well, this past April, he spoke directly to them, not in court, but at one of their conferences. This is what the people of Philadelphia saw during that week. And ladies and gentlemen, it is tearing the heart and soul out of them. They're frightened, frightened even beyond what reality would dictate. They're depressed, they're saddened, they're despairing. To the people of Philadelphia, guns aren't used for sport, guns aren't used for recreation, guns aren't even very successfully used for protection. Guns are used for killing people. But when you talk to these gun manufacturers, you talk to the sports enthusiasts, you'll get a whole different picture. The biggest misconception, I think, for people who live in cities, which is where most of the, the, the media are, originate from, the television shows come from, and obviously where most of the population is in the country, is that firearms primarily are anti-personnel items. Now, that's not true. I know that doesn't sound like that's, that's the case for someone in the city, because in the city, they either read about someone using the gun to harm someone or someone using the gun to protect themselves to defend their family. Either one of those is anti-personnel use, and, and because of that, is not a particularly pleasant topic to talk about. But get out of the city. Get out into where the rest of America is, where the people at this show come from, and you will see that firearms are used well over 99% of the time for legitimate purposes. So will Ed Rendell ever actually sue these guys? I wonder if he's backed off because he realized what I have, that what makes this such an impossible issue is not just the NRA and the gun lobby. It's the banks that pulled out and took jobs, industry, and decent housing with them. It's the years of police apathy and the incredible power of drug dealers. It's that and the laws that make getting a gun in this town easier than a driver's license. And the fact that in this country, when you talk about firearms, you discover there are two Americas, so radically divided, yet united by guns. Tomorrow night, David Turacamo will talk to the people who manufacture guns. Manufacturers who are caught themselves between legitimate sports and hunting enthusiasts and the bloody headlines that tend to dominate our news broadcasts. Part two of Under the Gun on Nightline tomorrow. And that's our report for tonight. For the latest overnight developments, watch Good Morning America tomorrow. I'm Ted Koppel in Washington. For all of us here at ABC News, good night. Nightline is always on with abcnews.com, on the web or AOL. Nightline has been a presentation of ABC News. More Americans get their news from ABC News than from any other source. ABC News. And you will see that firearms are used for legitimate purposes. Some are icons of American manufacturing. This is the kind of stuff that makes a cult a cult, all the hand finishing, the polishing. Others make cheap, low-quality handguns and seem to have only one market in mind. Here's a gun that, in essence, is on a fast track into criminal use. Tonight, one nation under the gun. From ABC News, this is Nightline. Reporting from Washington, Ted Koppel. One of the oldest slang expressions for a gun is that of equalizer. A gun in the hands of anyone prepared to use it makes most other factors, age, size, strength, more or less irrelevant. If you wade through the numbers that track the effectiveness of the gun as a killing device in most of our major cities, these statistics are chilling. It is quite literally child's play to kill someone with a gun. 
and a tragic percentage of those who are killed are themselves very young. More than half of the 399 homicide victims in Philadelphia alone, for example, back in 1996, were between 15 and 29 years of age. But the shooters in those cases, or in the horrible acts of violence that have drawn our attention these last few weeks and months in Arkansas and Mississippi, Pennsylvania and Oregon, do not represent in any fashion the majority of gun owners in the United States. There are somewhere in the neighborhood of 200 million guns in private American hands. And most of those owners who are careful, responsible, and safe in their use of firearms wonder how they can convince the rest of us to view them through fair and unbiased eyes. David Turacamo, who on last night's broadcast took us into the badlands of Philadelphia, returns tonight to present that other side of the story. I went to the one place where you can meet all the gun manufacturers in their element. I went to Vegas, to their annual convention, the SHOT Show. That's short for Shooting, Hunting, and Outdoor Trades Show. This is the largest collection of capitalists in the shooting sports industry. Uh, this, this really is a combination trade show, uh, hootenanny, uh, uh, alumni reunion. I don't really trust the media here, and I decided rather than a confrontation, I just wanted to listen. Because this is where the industry displays its wares, from guns and gadgets to ammo and outfits and every conceivable accessory. It's a $30 billion industry, and in some ways, it was exactly too. what I expected. When they look in the front of that barrel, that's, that's, there isn't any doubt about what's going on there. And nobody's confused in the room about who's who and what's what at that point in time. And, you solve a lot of social arguments instantly by just looking at one of these. But in a lot of ways, it was a complete surprise. For one thing, there's the fastest growing segment of that $30 billion, the women shooters. We're five years old. We're a membership-driven organization. Our focus is to introduce women, new women, into the shooting sports of rifle, pistol, shotgun, and archery. Um, we're a you shoot yourself? Uh, yes, I do. I am a two-time national champion, a three-time World Cup medalist. I'm your current international skeet champion right now. Why do you keep shaking your head at me? There are guns as art. 309000 This is the wholesale price. <laughs> For the four of them, though. I think this is the most expensive set they have. It's all gold um, engraved, if you see. There's lots of gold on it. All the people that I've been talking to, it's very interesting because uh, they love more their gun than their wife, I think. And there's nostalgia, a multi-million dollar subset devoted to cowboys. It's a part of American history. It's, this country was built off the back of a horse with a rifle. In fact, I'd forgotten that as a kid, my heroes were Gene Autry and Hopalong Cassidy, Davy Crockett and Roy Rogers. That's me with Roy at age four back in the days when guns weren't politically incorrect. It's a whole different perspective. I mean, there's two, set, there's two things here. When you're talking about guns getting off the streets, I'm talking about the recreational fun sport of shooting, which takes skill, which takes some marksmanship, which takes some technique, poise, composure. It's a whole different mentality. It has nothing to do with with guns on the street and gun crime. This is a sport that's a lot of fun. Get out there and try it. Take any object that has an aesthetic component and a, and a handling component as well as a practicality component. Um, it, it has beautiful lines to it. It emulates Steve Sinetti is vice president of Sturm Ruger, and like most people trim, in the industry, he's a shooter it's himself. It's a very responsive handling gun, so when you're shooting at clay targets with, with travel at 70 miles an hour, the gun needs to be responsive. The biggest misconception, I think, for people who live in cities, which is where most of the, the, the media are, originate from, the television shows come from, and obviously where most of the population is in the country, is that firearms primarily are anti-personnel items. Now that's not true. They either read about someone using the gun to harm someone or someone using the gun to protect themselves to defend their family. But get out of the city. Get out into where the rest of America is, where the people at this show come from, and you will see that firearms are used for legitimate purposes. It was something I'd hear again and again from people in different ways. It's going out, whether it's um, shooting some targets or going hunting, putting the dogs out in the field, 
Um, you know, it's, it's, you see it in the Boy Scouts, um, and it's just a lifestyle for all of us. Part of this is, is, is an urban-rural struggle, too, and you got the people out state. If they make a 911 call, they aren't going to get an answer for 20-some minutes. Um, how much time is that for a criminal to do anything he needs to get done? and get out of town. That's the long and short of the deal. That's the equation that we solve for people. Well, they may talk tough about crime, but most of these guys are really worried about lawsuits and the future of their business. In fact, one told me privately that there were exhibitors there who shouldn't have been allowed in because their guns were meant for nothing but killing people. I think in any industry, you're, you're not going to be able to, to round up a homogeneous group. It's, it's, a, it's a large industry from all different parts of the country. Uh, and, and as is the case with, with many industries, you are not going to have a, 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 a complete agreement on, on, on if there is a problem, what kind of problem it is, how to attack it, what to do about it. All firearms are not assault weapons or, or machine guns. That, that's, a, that's a very odd misconception that, that the city-based media sometimes tend to propagate. And I discovered that the reality of the gun issue depends to a large degree on perceptions. It looks like it would take out a tank. No, it's a, no, no, it's a 22 it's very, caliber. As a matter of fact, it's part of the public misconception. That gun looks like that when actually it's a semi-automatic 22. That's what it is. Rick Washburn is a firearms consultant to the motion picture industry. This is our vault where we keep one representative sample of each type of firearm. Hollywood's made us think that criminals carry big, expensive guns. You're not going to go buy the most expensive gun you can get, knowing you, there's a high probability you're going to have to throw it away or dump it. If my gun's an expendable, if it's something that if I get in trouble, I'm going to dump. I'm going to throw it in a trash can, I'm going to throw it in a gutter, I'm going to throw it in the river, and I'm going to get me another one as soon as the heat's off. Who uses this gun versus this one? Well, this is what everybody would like to say that they got. Man, I got me a Desert Eagle. I'll keep it in my backpack. Of course, it never comes out because it can't. It's too big. He'd be arrested in a second with a gun mm -hmm. that big. Mm -hmm. This one. What gun? And that gun is what the Philadelphia case is all about. This is ABC News Nightline, brought to you by Canon. Uh, any company that makes products, we design new product, we, we sell it, we talk to our customers. It was the morning of March 24th, 1998, early spring in Connecticut. I was riding to work with Mark Fontaine. There's, uh, there's no difference between a firearms company and uh, a company like uh, IBM or, or Exxon. For a lot Mark of makes reasons, guns I mean, for a living. I could be doing the same thing at a, at a car company or at a wrench company or at uh, anything else. Um, our process and what we do is really no different than a product development process um, uh, anywhere else in corporate America. Except that this company's product is also an American icon, the stuff of legends. Mark works for the company begun by Samuel Colt in 1836. We have a historical department here who has the capability to research pedigree of any, of any weapon that we've ever manufactured. They can go back and get the serial number, they can tell you the day it was made, when it was shipped, how it was shipped, the caliber, the finish, you name it. This is all hand engraved, gold plated screws, gold hammer, gold trigger real ivory grips. This is, uh, it's like artwork. The majority of the people who would buy this kind of uh, firearm will never shoot it. It's artwork. They buy it like they would buy art. Mark was right. This could have been any corporate office anywhere in America. <laughs> Except that here, security is a lot tighter. Some of the employees uh, have an awful lot of pride here. They like to put up what they're uh, making in their, each of their departments. Um, so that's exactly what they're doing here. This is the kind of stuff that makes a cult a cult, all the hand finishing, the polishing, the concern, the, the detail into the, the presentation and look, um, all for that customer who's willing to pay a little extra for those uh, details. They are really sculpting the gun into what they want. They actually put their initials into it. Uh, there are certain collectors who want certain um, um, polishers. It's a dying art.
Actually, ever since Colt started up, the, uh, he's he's capitalized on engraved handguns right from their very first first days. Really? Yeah. It's a steel canvas for an, an artist it's to work on. The medium for the the artwork. That's all. And this is where the concept of mass production began among the old line Connecticut gun manufacturers like Colt, Remington, and Winchester, who worked with the United States Army. Before the War of 1812, every gun was handmade. If it broke on the battlefield, it couldn't be fixed. The Army needed weapons with interchangeable parts. So companies like Colt not only established America's military superiority, they were also the foundation of the Industrial Revolution in this country, paved the way for people like Henry Ford. During the um, uh, Vietnam War, um, most of the M16s used were actually function tested here in this range. And, and at the height of the, the production here, um, they probably did up to 70,000 rifles a month through this range, shooting uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Today, not only is the process changed, so have the guns. This is the real reason that Cole took the unprecedented step of allowing me in. They wanted to show off the next generation of firearms, the smart gun. It's a handgun controlled by computer, so it can only be fired by its owner. They found that 16 or 17 percent of all the policemen killed in the line of duty were killed with their own weapon, or with their partner's weapon. You could potentially reduce 16% of all the deaths in the line of duty if you came out with a gun that recognized its sole user. This is our first prototype. This prototype was made with uh, off-the-shelf components. The components are rather large. Um, you can see there's a, a motor sticking out the back of the uh, the firearm. There's a microchip in the watch band. In effect, that turns the gun on so it can be fired. The next version will be small enough so that you can wear it all the time. It can be buried in a watch, can be buried in a ring, can be buried in anything. Smart gun represents more than just a leap in technology. It's the industry's recognition that something's got to change. Ron Stewart is president of Colt. At the same time, we irritated people when we originally came out with the smart gun. You know, the, the NRA certainly didn't favor that approach. They thought it was uh, anti to the individual, anti to their idea or their interpretation of the Second Amendment. I, I, as I said before, we have to deal with what's going to make the company survive. It is almost impossible to separate passion from reality when you're dealing with guns. And when they asked me if I wanted to fire a couple of rounds, I, I hesitated, but... God, it's fun. Well, as I mentioned, this was the morning of March 24th, 1998. I didn't find out about it till much later that afternoon, but this was the day that four children and their teacher were gunned down in Jonesboro, Arkansas. I know that all of these people would have been revulsed by it, but as much as I admire the beauty and craftsmanship of these products, you can never forget what a gun can do. A scene like this couldn't have happened a few years ago. A gun opponent talking to the gun manufacturers. But what you're witnessing is the quiet break of the industry from the NRA. These people have their own association now, the American Shooting Sports Council, and they invited Rendell to speak to them. So, of course, the mayor took the opportunity to blast one of their members. We uh, are aware of a California-based gun manufacturer that lost 14,000 guns from its plant over the course of an 18-month period. 14,000 guns. That is unacceptable. He was talking about this man, Jim Waldorf, who owns Lorison Engineering of California. That's a, that's a hysterical issue, and that's an incorrect number. And, uh, you, you, know, you know, we did have a gun theft at the factory, but, you know, the gun theft at the factory uh, was perpetrated by an employee with a key to our inventory room. Waldorf claims it was less than 3,000, but whatever the numbers, what worries people is the way in which a group of manufacturers are doing business. Five companies, all in the Los Angeles basin, all specializing in handguns. They're known collectively as the Ring of Fire. These folks produce guns that, in the, in the opinion of industry experts themselves, are trash. Garen Wintemute is a doctor who spent the last several uh, years is, chronicling uh, the Ring of Fire. The Lorsen, Lorsen Engineering's 380 caliber semi-automatic pistol. Mm -hmm. By 1994, the Lorsen pistol was the most frequently traced gun in the United States. And it was again in 95, and again in 96, and again in 97. 
Lorsen's 380 semi-auto pistol only went on the market in large numbers in 1992. In a very few years, here's a gun that in essence is on a fast track into criminal use. One third of all the 380 caliber handguns sold in the United States in 1993 were ours. In other words, Waldorf contends that just because his gun is so popular, the sheer numbers of them out there, that's why they keep turning up in crimes. But maybe the connection isn't quite so coincidental. At least a part of the market that Larson has, has focused on uh, includes people who tend to misuse weapons. David Stewart is a professor of marketing at USC. He's been a consultant to companies like Coke, Hewlett Packard, Procter & Gamble. Which suggests that you know, there's a much higher rate of, of use of these low-end guns in, in, in crime. There tend to be uh, requests to trace them more often mm -hmm. than is, is the case. Even if you correct for the, the volume of sales, they distribute through uh, you know, pawn shops. For people who are not really interested in spending a lot of money, on a weapon, probably not terribly concerned about, about quality, uh, and who may be in fact interested in, in a disposable gun, something that they could use and, and pitch and it hasn't cost them very much. We've heard an alarming report that Robert Kennedy was shot. The problem goes back to the assassination of Robert Kennedy. Oh my God, Senator Kennedy has been shot. He was shot with a cheap imported handgun, a Saturday night special. That same year, 1968, Congress passed the Crime Bill, which stopped the importation of small, inexpensive handguns. But it created a market for cheap, disposable weapons, which could be manufactured here. So the ring of fire was ignited. And now it's the theft at Lorson that prompted Jack Scott, an assemblyman from Los Angeles, to sponsor a new bill. Some 14,000 guns had disappeared from Lorson Manufacturing and one year's time and when you consider that that's more guns that are stolen from all gun dealers throughout America annually it's uh, certainly a, a very difficult and reprehensible situation. I mean, Basically he wants the gun factories to maintain the same security level that's required of gun dealers. Potential. Those guns frankly have been discovered as far away as Charleston, South Carolina. And earlier this evening the California legislature passed Scott's bill. It's a feel-good type of piece of legislature. Uh, it could be a knee-jerk reaction as well. And, uh, you know, I don't think that there's a lot of parts of the bill that are really going to make a significant impact on what's going on in, in the firearms industry. Lorson's filed for bankruptcy. They've been hit with dozens of lawsuits by people who claim that the gun accidentally fired or exploded in their face. I believe very strongly that they have little, if any, commitment to producing firearms uh, that are quality products. And you don't have to take my word for it. One of the best sources of this kind of information comes from within the gun industry itself. It's a periodical known as Gun Tests. Gun Test magazine recently suggested that the Lorsen 9mm was best used as a doorstop. It is an industry that whether we like it or don't like it is headed toward some greater degree of regulation. The establishment of performance standards which is the same thing you're dealing with on toasters or the other stuff, mm -hmm. I don't think would be a bad issue. Mm -hmm. Because it would take uh, a number of the 7995 Saturday Night Specials out of the legality of the marketplace. The industry has successfully defended itself against lawsuits and legislative challenges before. And Ron Stewart's position is by no means popular or widely held. But in view of the current atmosphere, it may be the most realistic. Independent reporter and photographer David Turacamo. I'll be back with a program note in a moment. Run on the sale of assault weapons. 75% support registration of all handguns. And 66% support a nationwide ban on gun sales on the Internet. We'll be back in a moment. This is ABC. But this individual isn't the norm, and I think that's what's important. You're going to have some cases that are going to come about that uh, are just going to be unusual. I think gun control is very important. I think for the vast majority of cases that we handle, gun control can work and does work. Well, if you can be a little bit more specific, what kinds of things specifically could help you? Well, the background checks is a good example. I mean, uh, in, in many instances, just as a, a mere background check would at least make it a lot more difficult for a, a criminal to get his hands on a gun. Uh, that would at least stand a chance 
chance of preventing some crimes from occurring. Um, certainly uh, uh, not allowing uh, criminals with uh, prior convictions uh, to be in possession of handguns is, is another measure that I think is very important and would probably go a long way in reducing some of the crime. Ron Brownstein, after each of these tragedies, there's a big public outcry, crackdown on guns, but when it gets to Congress, not much seems to happen. Why not? Well, that's right. I think that there are a variety of reasons why you don't see the broad poll numbers translate into specific legislation. Start with the basics. At the moment, you have a Republican-controlled House and Senate, and ideologically, Republicans are generally cool to these kinds of extensions of federal control over the day-to-day -day lives of people that they see gun control as being. Secondly, the NRA, the National Rifle Association, is a very effective lobbying institution. Uh, they're very good, not only in the way, uh, effective in the way they spend their money, but also in generating uh, voter and, and grassroots pressure on legislators. And finally, Chris, I think the, you know, the reality is, is that you have, I, I think, a, a widening regional variation on these issues. The broad poll numbers, the needle is clearly tilting toward greater support for gun control, but there's still a lot of differences between the intensity of support for gun control, say, along the coasts, and, and in the, the, the heartland, the, the, the big, the great L that runs from the mountain states and the plain states across the deep south. You have a much more entrenched gun culture in those states, and you see legislators from those states much more leery in both parties about supporting gun control. When you net all that out, there's still a narrow anti-gun control majority uh, in, in, the, uh, in the Congress on most issues. Ron, let me ask you about another factor that we found in that recent ABC News poll, when we asked people whether they favor stricter gun control laws, uh, it was very sizable, two to one, 63 percent to 35 percent. But when we asked them whether they thought stricter gun control would actually reduce violent crime, it was evenly split, 50 percent to 48 percent. So doesn't that reduce the pressure out there if people don't think it's going to work anyway? Well, I'm not sure. I mean, I think those results, first of all, those results are not surprising. They're pretty consistent with what we've seen over the last several years. And I don't really think they're contradictory. What they tell us, above all, is that Americans quite correctly see gun violence as a complex problem without any single solution. If you ask in an open-ended question, people say they want to see greater efforts to strengthen the family, greater efforts to remove violence from TV and, uh, and movies, a tougher sentencing, but also gun control. They don't see these, Chris, I think, as incompatible choices. It isn't as if, if you believe that you have to strengthen the family, that means that you don't want background checks at gun shows. I think people see these things as all part of a package that has to be done, and even then, we may be disappointed in the result. Professor Cottrell, I, I gather you think that the people are onto something when they express some serious doubts about more gun control laws. Uh, yes, in part. Let me, if I might return to something that uh, Chief Ramsey was saying, uh, I think certainly we're all shocked and horrified by tragedies such as the one occur that occurred at Fort Worth and occurred at Columbine. Uh, the question is, uh, should our shock at those tragedies uh, obscure the fact that those particular kinds of actions are going to be very hard to control by any conceivable gun control regime and might they uh, stop us from looking at what we can do to control gun violence? Uh, one of the difficulties I have with the idea of, well, let us have simply more and more gun control, I'm not opposed to all forms of gun control, I believe, for example, in background checks, uh, at making sure that people with felony convictions should not have guns. Uh, but one of the things we have to realize is an awful lot of what we do in the name of gun control is controlling essentially law-abiding citizens who are going to go through the hoops and make the background checks and whatnot. We need to do more to control the real sources of gun violence in our country, which in fact are career criminals. But Professor, when we talk about some of these more broader based things, and for yes. instance the administration now is talking about safety locks on triggers or a 72-hour background check at gun shows, is that really so oppressive? Well, let's stop and think about it. My understanding with seven, a 72-hour background check on, on, on gun shows, uh, the first question we always have to ask is what is it going to do? What do we hope that this is going to do? Um, you know, is this in fact going to lead to a reduction in gun violence or is it simply going to be more wheel spinning uh, on our part? Right. Trigger locks I think are a more complex uh, issue. I think people certainly should, if they have children, have their guns locked or, or stored away in locked uh, uh, containers. Uh, but also, one of the things I think you have to realize is that the more a gun is locked, the less you're likely to be able to use it for self-defense. Gentlemen, I have to break in here, but when we return, I want to ask you all about some other ideas about how to stop the violence and also about how big this issue will be in the 2000 presidential campaign. And we'll continue our discussion in a moment.
Lee, or at least we think that the Larry Ashbrooks of the world wouldn't be in that line waiting to sell their guns. So who are you targeting in an effort like that? Well, it was actually almost 3,000 guns that we were able to uh, uh, get as a result of the gun buyback program. But I think that a mistake is, is made when we think that the only population that we're trying to reach is just a criminal population. You have a lot of situations where guns are used not by people who are quote-unquote criminals, but people who just for a moment uh, resort to a violent act. An example would be domestic violence. If you've got a gun in the household and if you've got two people in an argument, a gun could be introduced. If you've got a situation where a person driving down the street suddenly cut off, if they got a gun in the glove box, we have this phenomenon that we now call road rage. Uh, and, and that's not even talking about accidental shootings where just a child finds a gun and accidentally shoots a sibling. So there's a lot of violence that's caused by handguns or people using handguns that I think we can do a lot to reduce. So it's taken a little chunk at a time out of the problem. Some of it is through gun buyback, some could be through gun control. I think it's a combination of factors. Chief, let me look at that. Let's look again at that ABC News poll and some of the, some of the ideas that the public seem to think were good ideas for gun control. Uh, background checks at gun shows, mandatory trigger locks, ban on assault weapons, handgun registration, ban internet gun sales. What do you think of those? How much would they help? Well, I think it would help a great deal, and I, I think that when you take a look at those numbers, you really have to ask, why are we even having this debate? I mean, if, if our elected officials are there to serve and, and to really fulfill the wishes of the public that puts them in office, I don't know why we're sitting here having this, this debate, because those numbers are really, quite frankly, overwhelming. And uh, I guess it just points to the fact that politics and public safety doesn't always mix. Pro Professor Cottrell, I mean, we're not talking here about banning guns or even banning concealed weapons. Aren't there some sensible ideas there? Well, let's look at some of these ideas. For example, you mentioned registration. Who's going to register their guns? And, uh, you know, the ordinary citizen will, the law-abiding citizen will. Criminals won't register their guns, so what use is it going to be? What effect is it going to have? What, at the end of the day, is going to be the difference? Well, Chief Ramsey? Well, being able to trace a gun's history and, and find out who the owner is. As I said before, there's always going to be an element that's not going to conform, and I don't care if you say you want background checks or if you want registration. They may not do it. It doesn't mean that gun registration is a bad idea. We have to register automobiles. So what's wrong with registering a gun? Well, first of all, uh, one of the problems that we have with this is we know that if we have a system of registration, we may be able to trace guns of law-abiding citizens, but criminals will simply get it on the black market. I would disagree, by the way, with Chief Ramsey that a substantial problem is the ordinary citizen having a gun. The substantial problem is people with criminal backgrounds, histories of mental instability, and histories of violence. Those are the people we should be trying to control. Well, it's, it's really both. I mean, I've been in this business 30 years, and I've been to many a crime scene, and I'm here to tell you that the problem isn't just limited to a group of people that we consider to be hardened criminals. There are a lot of people that just in a moment of rage get involved in arguments, resort to firearms, and we wind up with a homicide or a very serious injury to another person uh, as a result well, of that. Well, well, gentlemen, uh, Professor, let, let me bring in Ron Brownstein mm -hmm. here if I can. Uh, Ron, we're gearing up now for the 2000 presidential yeah. campaign. How big an issue will this be? Probably pretty substantial. I think you're seeing two separate movements that point in the same direction. First, in the Democratic primary, both Al Gore and Bill Bradley are going well beyond what we're discussing today in terms of their proposals for further gun control. Bill Bradley is talking about handgun registration. Al Gore is talking, talking about licensing handguns, either one of which, should they win the uh, general election, would be an enormous legislative fight. On the other side, I think all the Democrats see gun control as potentially one of the principal vulnerabilities of Governor Bush. Uh, Texas is a state in that conservative L from the, from, the, from the mountain states through the deep south where the gun culture is very strong. He has signed a, a legislation down there that allows people to carry concealed weapons. He signed a bill this year that barred cities from suing gun manufacturers, the top priority of the NRA. Inside the state of Texas, those are fairly major mainstream positions, but you take them outside of Texas, you move them uh, to California or the suburbs of Illinois or the suburbs of Michigan, and I think Democrats believe that is going to be a principal vulnerability. Uh, Governor Bush is trying to, you know, uh, defend himself. He's taking some moderate positions on raising the age of handgun ownership, not supporting a repeal of the assault weapon ban, but the existing record in Texas, I think, Chris, is going to be an irresistible target for Democrats uh, in 2000. But you know, Ron, in that ABC News poll, we asked people about issues in the 2000 campaign. Campaign, gun control ranked 12th 
of 15 issues. So it doesn't seem to be much of a priority, apparently, because, you know, going back to the other result, they don't think that it's going to have much effect anyway. So is it, you know, maybe something they, they know when they see the difference, is it the kind of thing they'll actually vote on? Well, I think that it's a, it's a mistake to assume that many people vote on any single issue. I think what increasingly happens in politics is that campaigns try to use a whole complex of issues to paint a picture of the candidate around which voters will either say, yeah, that's me, I identify with that, or it's not. I think for the Democrats, they will try to use Bush's positions, if he is the nominee, on guns, abortion, school vouchers, the environment, a whole series of things to move him out of the center and make him less acceptable to suburban swing voters. And in that litany, Chris, I do think that guns is, is, is part of that and, and a central element of that for Democrats if it's going to work at all. Chief Ramsey, we have less than 30 seconds left as you go about your business fighting crime here in the nation's capital. How much are you counting on new gun control measures to help you? Well, I'd like to be able to think that I could count on gun control measures to be able to do it, but I don't think any one measure is going to be the, uh, the end solution. I think we've got to recognize that we live in a very violent society, and we've got to change the attitudes of a lot of people and look at this whole picture, not just a piece of it. Chief Ramsey, Ron Brownstein, Professor Cottrell, thank you all very much for joining us tonight. Thank you. And I'll be back in a moment.